All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this live stream. I'm here with Nathan, and we write Ubuntu books, so we, we have that in common. We caught up with each other at All Things Open. That's where we met. We've been talking about this for a while, but content creation is always, you know, busy. So we're finally getting it done, though. So how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Not not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, living the dream, I, I should say. Writing books and making Linux content. I mean, what could be better, right? That's right. Yeah, so, I'm looking forward to uh, to the next next project. <laughs> you know, I'm I, I kind of am too, but at the same time, it's like there's always that time where it's like, do I really want to think about that right now after how much work that was? <laughs> but then again, you're always thinking about the next thing at the same time. So I figured what we'll do is uh, maybe grab some questions. There's often like a delay. I've noticed, I think there's a way to fix it, but with all things, I haven't looked into it yet. So um, maybe we'll just chat about some things. And then when we see some questions come up, either of us could just grab a question. So fantastic. So um, there's no agenda. Basically, we could just chat. Uh, so maybe I'll just interview you a couple, ask a couple questions just to kind of get it started. So um, how long was the process for you, for the writing process until, until it was published? Um. Well, those are two different questions. So yeah, well, yeah, well, it was a good place to start. But you're right, it's right? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the the uh, I do a lot of uh, fiction uh, indie publishing as well, so I'm well well aware because um, right when you write your own book and you're traditionally published, you do all the steps or you do uh, all the steps of the writing, and then that's it. You're done. The, right. the end, right? Uh, except they make you write the back cover of your books now, and that's oh, well, that's how it is. Yeah, that's um, a good point. I, I thought that was weird too, actually. Yeah, because then they don't have to pay someone to do it. And uh, well, but the nice thing too is that like, uh, like it, what they used for the back cover, cover of my book was actually the like the abstract, I think, that I sent in as a proposal. And they tweaked it a little, but it was basically that. So, um, but today they're not, in my last contract, they're not pretending anymore. They're just right the back cover of the book. But um, so the interesting thing about the writing process was um, it was a lot more work than I thought it would be. Um, by the time I, I, I was offered, uh, hey, do you want to write a book? Send a proposal in. I said, yeah, well, sure, why not? It sounds fun. Yes, actually, I've been thinking about it. Uh, easy, right? I had already yeah. written uh, half a dozen just little short stories. And like, you can just sit down and, and just fly and have fun. Uh, certain writers can. Some writers, it takes longer. That's, that's OK. Um, right. but it doesn't have to. And so, um, yeah, I started writing the book, and I, I started um, I started working on the book, and I wrote basically an introduction talking about Debian and Ubuntu and free software in a very generic way, just set the scene. Why is Ubuntu special? Why is Ubuntu as opposed to everything else? And uh, that was kind of easy. I did a little fact checking, but I knew all that. And then I started writing the installation chapter one install. And you need this and that, and it takes this much. And I remember sitting down and thinking, this sure is a lot a lot faster, and I, all I have to do is just make stuff up. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's, it's um, a so little known. It, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Ed. I said, well, because it took so long, I had to edit up. Uh, I thought I could sit down and just devote like three weeks and get it done, and it took uh, it took several months. <laughs> so, what's it, what, not, what on my side? I'll add to that. Um, I thought the same thing, but for a different reason. I thought that, you know, and I I thought this last time too, and I was wrong last time. I'm I'm wrong this time. I I kind of thought that being an update, a new edition would make it like super easy. Like, oh, all I got to do is just make sure everything works on the newest version, mm -hmm. uh, make sure all the screenshots are updated and just everything is tested. I don't even have to like write the entire thing. It strangely takes about the same amount of time. And I've never been able to quantify that. It's, it's probably part of my perfectionism, but at the same time, um, I think the workload, the, the length of time for me doesn't change. It's just the nature of the work changes, I guess. It's kind of weird. Yeah, the, for the second edition, because everything was so similar with uh, from Ubuntu 1404 to 1604, um, it took me 56 hours to update the book. I did it in a week. And then mm. the next Monday, I was uh, just, um, uh, I just spent seven hours just updating every single screenshot, um, which is also my least favorite thing to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, you kind of have to, either you're doing them when you, as you go in, uh, and I decided I'll save time and I won't, I'll just go through. Uh, or you're you're doing as you go along, or you have to recreate everything, uh, you know, again, to, for the screenshot. And so depending on 
in neither way is wrong. Uh, but um, yeah, so this from uh, 1604 to 2204, which is the third edition, everything was different. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the things about applications didn't change. All the installation, the setup, where things were. So it was a tremendous amount of work. Um, I kind of knew that going in, but that that was like several months again. So yeah. uh, there's a question from the chat. It mm -hmm. said, uh, "Why an Ubuntu book and not just a Linux book?" Because other than some minor details, the, the distro seems trivial. And um, so the reason for my book is beginning even I should probably plug the book. Uh, it's beginning Ubuntu. For yeah, we probably Ubuntu should have mentioned the names of our books. I just kind of assumed right. everyone knew. And that's not true. Everyone doesn't know. We should mention that. Right. Um, so my book is a beginning Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users. And I, I made it very, I, I tailored it very specifically because I wanted it to be for someone who, uh, you know, has an older computer and they've heard about Linux, which usually means they've heard about Ubuntu. And they're like, oh, I, I heard you put it on there and the computer works like new again, um, which is true, but is, uh, doesn't guarantee a good time when you're running everything and trying to figure everything out. So I said, well, let me write a book about someone who can use a computer uh, but just, you know, is trying this out. Either they want to do a boot or they have an old business machine or whatever. And so I wanted to be very, very uh, specific uh, so that, and the book mentions, I think, uh, I know what the flavors and probably the distros. Once you're, anything you learn in Ubuntu is broadly applicable to any Linux distro. So if you want to try other things out, that's okay. You get to keep everything you learn. So, uh, uh, but that, that's that because I'm, uh, I, I'm the uh, uh, owner of the uh, Ubuntu California local community team, and I was uh, now I'm actually on the Ubuntu community council, and so um, I'm familiar with Ubuntu. I think I thought that would make a a better book. I could make a generic Linux book, but uh, I wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a so there's a couple things in there. Um, I also want to mention, but I feel like the experience was very similar for me. But as far as like why I chose to write an Ubuntu book, I kind of didn't. Um, I, I know that's the surprising answer, but um, as an aside, I, I do enjoy Ubuntu. I, if I didn't, I wouldn't write about it. If I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't write about it. I'm not going to say, oh, you want to pay me to do a thing? Um, if I don't like to do the thing, I'm not going to do the thing. If I don't believe in it, I'm not going to do it. Um, so there's always that. So it was kind of a coincidence in a way. I have already written some books in the past and then my publisher came to me and, and asked me if I wanted to write an Ubuntu server book. And I never really had a chance to think about it. Um, I, I was so razor focused or laser focused, not razor focused, laser focused on the YouTube channel and the content that I was creating there. So I never really had a minute to think about what I wanted to write about because I was just so busy with that. But then when my publisher came to me and like, hey, do you want to write a book about Ubuntu server? I'm like, well, yeah, I, I mean, I cover that a lot on the channel, so it's not going to be the hardest thing to cover. So, yeah, I'll take that project on. And th that's how my publisher was. And they, they still send me ideas um, a lot. Actually, will you write about this? Will you write about this? I, um, if, if people understood how many I turned down, um, it'd be kind of surprising, mm -hmm. I think, because you can't write about everything. I mean, there's only so much time. And, and what some people may not realize at first is if you write too much, then you'll have to keep updating those. Next thing you know, you might even have overlapping projects just to keep everything current. So you got to choose something that um, is going to create more work for yourself as much as you can help it. So that's kind of why I chose it. They offered it to me. I probably would have chose it anyway on my end, but they kind of came to me and that's what they wanted to do. So that's the reason why I wrote about Ubuntu server. But I, I thought of it as a huge honor that they asked me at the time that my YouTube channel was not nearly as popular as it is now back then. So I just felt like, yeah, cool. I'll, I'll do that. That sounds like an amazing opportunity. It totally was. But um, I guess depending on the publisher, whether or not it's the author pitching to the publisher or the, pitch, or the publisher looking for people, um, it can go either direction. So, Definitely yeah. true. Uh, another nice thing about writing about uh, Ubuntu is um, it has a very definite scheduled release cadence. Yes. So I know when I write a, a Ubuntu desktop book, I know exactly how long that book's going to be fresh, which is three years maybe, and then, um, and then I know it's harder to say how. So you could you what well, you could take in the first edition, and you could have gotten about fourteen or four, and picked up even to sixteen or four, and you would have been totally fine. Um, but then 
1804 comes out and it's all obsolete. So uh, um, it's good for, you could still thumb through, th thumb, thumb through it and say, uh, oh, I want to write uh, things or I want to stargaze. And all those things were still accurate. Um, but all the stuff like this is how you find your way around. This is what this is what the top icons do. Uh, that's all completely obsolete. And so, on the one hand, it's kind of nice. It's kind of a guaranteed. Um, if, well, my publisher should be uh, publisher should be interested in having a newer uh, uh, version in a couple of years. Um, right. That's good to kind of that's that's always fun. But also the nice thing is that um, a couple of years is about the right amount of time where I forget how hard it was to write the book in the first place and am excited again. So. I, Right. That, that's important to uh, to be yeah. excited. Um, yeah. So I realized there's another part of the question I, I forgot to answer. Why not just a general Linux book? Because even though they came to me, I could have said, no, I'd rather do a general Linux book. I could have could have went that direction. But I have done that. And it was uh, I can't remember what year it came out. I'm not recommending anyone buy this book right now because it's severely out of date. There was never a second edition. So if you buy this book, I, I can't guarantee how much it will work with current Linux because we're talking, I don't know if it's 2015 or earlier. Anyway, uh, Mastering Linux Network Administration uh, was the name of the book. And I covered Debian, Ubuntu, and CentOS at the time. And Debian, Ubuntu, obviously, uh, so much overlap there. It's easy. But even with just two distributions chosen, if you count Debian and Ubuntu as one thing for the most part, it was tough, more than you would think. Because it's like, yeah, this distribution, here's where you go to manage your network connections, but you do it differently on this one. And Debian's a little bit older, so they haven't picked up this change that Ubuntu has yet, and neither right. has CentOS. So Ubuntu's ahead here. They're using this file. But then, you know, going on from there, I, I think you already kind of know and experience this a lot. It actually was a lot harder, in my opinion, than the um, book being focused on Ubuntu for me. Believe it or yeah, not. even when um, I, I briefly mentioned towards the end of my book how to use uh, the command line to install applications, because mm -hmm. um, that's someone everyone should know how to do. You shouldn't have to, but uh, if you go to if you ask for help online, they're going to they're going to tell you open a terminal and type in this. Right. Uh, and so it's very very important. Uh, it was important to me to have so that's chapter five is command line basics. It was important for me to um, explain. All right, so this. You don't need the terminal, but it's kind of fun. But you're going to be asked to use it, and this is why: because you can give specific instructions. That's why they tell you to do that. And these are some. And look, it's not scary. It's, and here's some fun stuff. And here's NetHack. And here's uh, uh, MTR. You know, ping. Right? Those kind of things. And uh, this is what web browsing used to look like in the you know from 1993 to 1996. Right? You know, <laughs> uh, with links. And um, oh boy. Uh, so that you know when people um you know uh have to be in the terminal because they're troubleshooting because it, it, it happens a lot of people never have to touch it um but it does happen and it should it's not something to be afraid of but you should also know you're you are instructing the computer to do different things so you do have to kind of look at the uh at the commands and make sure that they make some kind of sense um and so i had to suddenly had to talk about snaps and um you know on the command line and um uh you know just briefly mention it because in this in the software store it's it's all automatic it's just you pick what you want and it just works right and you don't have to worry about it and on the command line you might you might say but it wasn't yeah wasn't that difficult either i completely agree with your stance and i think as an aside i mean i i think if people understood where we came from it'd be no question why 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 do people still use the command line right because <laughs> i i argue and I, and I firmly believe you don't need it you just don't. I mean, it's great to know it, just like you were saying, but you don't have to. Obviously, if you chose like Gen 2 or something, of course, yeah, you're using the command line, okay? Right. But if it's a, if it's like a desktop distribution for general purpose, you you don't have to. But what when you and I, um, probably more so you, because I think you started before I did, but um, the, the ecosystem was that you could not predict anything. So if you think about a Windows system or a Mac OS system, Someone wants to write a tutorial on a blog post. They're going to tell you, you know, click on the Apple logo in the top left corner or click on the start menu and, and go up there. And they, there's a very specific order of operations with the GUI to get to things. Um, meanwhile, at, you know, back then, you didn't know what someone's user interface would look like. I mean, it wasn't just are they running uh, GNOME, uh, KD at the time, now Plasma, 
um, XFCE, you didn't know, right? But it was worse than that because even if you knew or just assumed everyone ran, you know, GNOME or Plasma or something, you'd still be wrong. You don't know where they put the panel. Um, click on the bottom left corner. There might not be anything there because they might have moved it to the top. Or as, as I was doing, which is hilarious, I was like, can I have a panel on every single side of the screen? Yes, you can. And I absolutely had a panel everywhere. <laughs> and I had all of my icons, like it looked horrible. Like for every it's app I installed, had icons going around the, your screen on panels. Um, <laughs> but nobody, but Linux people, we customize a lot. Maybe not as much now, but back then you had no way of knowing. The command line was the only way you could tell someone to do something and they do it, you say it, and it happens the way that you, you think it's going to happen. With the GUI, you have no idea. I've had people delete panels on, on GNOME and like, I can't do anything. I don't have an applications menu. I don't have a panel. I have nothing but wallpaper. <laughs> That's what we had to deal with. So I think that probably is part of the reason. But um, I'm going to probably take this one. You could you may know more. I don't know if I've ever asked you about this before, but um, about pass through. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I I think it's important for me to answer just so everyone knows what my stance is. I, I kind of feel like I just haven't seen a use case for it yet in my mind. Um, a big use case for PCI pass through is for video cards for gaming. But in my, on my end, I, build a, I built a 10 gig streaming server. So I could just stream over Steam streaming to any computer I want. It doesn't even matter. But the actual question is about monitor resolutions. Um, and that's the part I don't know because um, I thought, I guess that makes sense because the monitor info isn't being sent, I would assume. Uh, have you worked on that? Oh. Yes. So um, the monitor info is being sent, but it's just sending generic, uh, you know, standard resolutions because the, any operating system, you know, from DOS to you know, Windows 15 is going to be able to work with it. So um, the trick is that you uh, uh, you can set uh, custom resolutions in, say, vert, well, it depends on the, I, as I immediately assume, this is the hard part about writing books, I immediately was thinking about VirtualBox. So um, in VirtualBox, you can set custom resolutions, uh, and then they will be available, uh, they should be available, um, if, if the OS is reading the EDDI data from the monitor and um because it's all virtualized um and of course the auto resize works if you have the guest extensions installed um but the, the os itself isn't usually set up to deal with a monitor that is can be an arbitrary resolution and that's that's kind of the the bottleneck um, so that's wow. that's just default settings that are safe uh, for most os's and you can tweak them uh it depends on your on your uh, hypervisor so read your online help and Cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah, it, I've always thought of it as finicky, but I might be over exaggerating it, it, a, it a bit. Um, but th there's a lot to it. it and I, I don't think it's nearly, from what I've seen, as complicated now as it was when this kind of first started coming around. Um, but I just went a different direction. So it was, it was interesting to hear uh, your, your feedback on that because uh, there's definitely people that know more about that than I do. And I think you're the person that knows more about this. So appreciate that. Yeah. Well, that's that's the fun of being in a community is that you know everyone has their things that they like, and mm -hmm. um, although my my particular interest isn't a virtual machine resolution mon monitor resolutions, but uh, you know uh, by all coming together and asking those questions, um, you get the answers and you share what you know at another time. So uh, there's a question I want to kind of grab from early on, uh, where someone uh, said, "Is it fair to state the release schedule of Ubuntu is too regular?" It might be better to wait a couple extra months so that you can get support for like newer, a new generation of graphics cards. Um, right. And so I would say uh, no, uh, it's that's not fair for two reasons. And one is that um, so you can't plan ahead. So uh, AMD and Nvidia aren't going to you know let Canonical in on the secret of when they're releasing their their new things because one that's they give their competitors the edge up on things. Uh, two. Um, well, then Canonical would have to, if, if the release date suddenly changed, then one, everyone would know what happened, uh, and then their competitors would get a heads up. And two, uh, you would then break uh, the uh, deployment schedule and planning of every corporation in the world that was depending on that cadence. Uh, plus, you know, there's a there's a support life cycle, and now what's going on with that? Is it extended three months? Uh, you're paying other people long? It just doesn't make any sense. But here's the other great thing is that when an LTS comes out, so every six months there's an Ubuntu release. 
And mm -hmm. so it gets the newest kernel that's, that's been tested, it gets newer drivers. So when an LTS comes out, uh, three months later, it gets the point release, which means we take the installer, we take all the updates and put it back into the install image so that you have uh, less you know, downloading to do, better security. And then every six months after that, so on a three, so a new release comes out, and then three months later, the, uh, the LTS gets a point release. And when that happens for the point two, it gets. But actually, I think that might have changed. I think for uh, this cycle, twenty two or four, I think the point one uh, as well, uh, but also gets a kernel mm -hmm. update. Uh, it used to be you had to opt in uh, with the point zero right. or point one, and then point two, uh, you had to opt out, right? Um, so. Uh, Ubuntu does get the LTSs, which are the ones you're supposed to, you know, run for for, for a long time. Uh, does actually get newer hardware support, so um, you kind of get the best of both worlds there. Uh, but is it fair to say it's really frustrating when uh, a card comes out a month after Ubuntu comes out and there's no no support? Yes, yes, that's awful. There you go. See, one, this is where day. I give you a practical response. I agree completely. So I bought this thing, right? And notice it's in the box. This isn't an empty box. I'm not using this video card because right now there's some distributions that support it. It takes a little bit. So um, to expand on what you're saying or what you've said, uh, I feel like this is something that really sets Ubuntu apart from Debian because um, there's a different mindset and Debian's mindset is changing right now. So I'll be the first to say my opinion right now isn't technically fair, um, but it is based on a uh, historic sense. So Ubuntu will come out with a release every six months, like you've already mentioned, you already talked about the, the drivers and such. Um, so the thing to understand about this is that um, Windows is the only operating system uh, today where the primary method of delivering drivers is the GPU vendor releases the drivers directly to the people, right? They they probably work with Microsoft on some things. I'm not saying it's, you know, hands off on Windows between the two. I'm sure there's, you know, com communication there. But AMD and NVIDIA, if they want to release a new driver, do you know what they do? They just release it. They don't like ask for permission. There's no merge window. There's um, nothing that has to be upstreamed and looked at by anyone other than their own people. Now there's pros and cons there. Um, other operating systems outside of Windows build the drivers into the kernel. So everything works out of the box. Downside is that there's a waiting period between when you when the hardware comes out and you can use it because you have the drivers have to be there. Right, it's a chicken and egg problem. The reason why they're there first in Windows is because the, the, I mean, the vendor made sure of that they the, they developed the driver, the installer, and everything had it ready before re release day. Done, already supported. Um, so that's just one of those things to keep in mind because some people will try a distribution that's already a couple of years old and doesn't have LTS or I mean the um, hardware and enablement updates, and they'll get frustrated that a brand new computer they bought or video card um, doesn't work. Well, the thing is the operating system if that's how it's designed, can't work with something that didn't exist at the time that it came out. Just much in the same way, try to install that video card I just showed you on a Windows 7 machine and see if it's detected out of the box. I guarantee it's not going to be, right? You're going to have the 640 by 480 resolution. But that's kind of why it is the way that it is. And I really like, um, although I feel like Ubuntu solution isn't perfect, I think it's the best thing that we have right now. And the fact that they release this frequently gives us the ability to have something bleeding edge when we want it. We don't have to have it. But if our hardware requires it, we could go to that release and then we could just stabilize on the next LTS release. We could just keep writing the intermediary, intermediary that's hard word to say for some reason, releases in, until the next LTS and just stay to that, stay on that. So that's often a good entry to Ubuntu is just use a current interim and then standardize an LTS later. And usually that'll that'll get you very far. But in my case, um, even Pop! OS doesn't support this video card yet, but they're about to. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but um, they're they're working on it, and and a lot of the moving pieces are there. They even gave me a PPA to install and test. There's just one more component, and it could land any time. And then Pop OS will have support for this video card. But it's kind of um, I know we kind of got off into another subject when it was just asked if it's released too often. But I think that's probably why I uh, you alluded to you don't feel that it's too often, and I don't either. The other thing about that, um, answering the question more directly. There's never a time when there's no bugs. And, and a, there's never a moment where if you give the developers all the time in the world that they're like, yep, there's zero bugs, it's ready. No, 
There, there's manageable bugs, a lower number of bugs, but at no point is the Bugzilla databases out there ever at zero. It just doesn't happen. So one frame of mind is release when ready, but when is ready? Like that's how Fedora does it. There's nothing wrong with that. But then again, it's also a moving target that you're trying to hit. And that's a really hard balance to hit. That's why we have the, some of the issues that we have today because of that balance. So Yeah, and that's that's why, for example, um, you know, Ubuntu uh, LTSs won't recommend the next LTS until uh, three months later, once it's hit that 0.1 yep. release, it's a server side button they can hit. Um, and a lot of people online recommend, um, you know, the LTS comes out and it's super buggy and it crashes all the time and it's unreliable and you shouldn't install it. It's completely unfit for purpose and you shouldn't ever install it until the 0.1 release. And um, for me, uh, if I were in, in crunch time, uh, you finishing a, a translation of a, of a book for a client right now, and didn't, you know, I, I would be running the, um, by now I've probably been running for about, about a month the the dev version of like the next release you know mm -hmm. uh it's super stable it's 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 um there's nothing wrong with it they test them all the day uh, uh, every day they test them all the time they you know developers usually run that version um so it's not um it's actually really is usually a smooth process but um yep. you know at the same time those three months you know do, do smooth out wrinkles and bugs um so you know, the Firefox uh, snap, for example, started very slowly the first time you ran it um, for about three months. And after a month and a half, it got down to about two thirds as much time. And after about another two weeks, it was down to a third. And now it's almost, there's no difference. Uh, but um, yeah, that those three months would have made a big difference for people upgrading. So uh, it really depends on what your, um, what your appetite for adventure is when it comes to your operating system. Right. Um, but once the release is out, uh, you know, we have delayed uh, the the release by a week because it's always a Thursday, but we have delayed a, a, for one week, you know, because there were issues. So it's, it's um, by the time we're not afraid to do that. So by the time it's released, it's something you can trust. Yeah, that, that's a That's a very good point as well. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, there, there's just so I feel like we could just do a, a whole video just alone about distribution <laughs> releases and, and right. the quirks around Re that because there's a lot. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll just pick a random one here. Um, and this is more of an aside, but yeah, I mean, and on Arch, you're, go you're going to notice this a lot. I, and I like Arch a lot. Uh, you could be on an, if you, if you, if someone doesn't use Arch and they don't know this, you could be on an LTS kernel or, uh, you know, the normal kind of bleeding edge kernel or the standard one. But, um, yeah, I mean, with, with something like Arch Linux, you get those updates, um, when they're ready, but at the same time, you know, you, you get the updates when they're when they're released. Maybe not. Re maybe I shouldn't say ready, but uh, Arch Linux, as you, as you probably know, just gives you everything as it is. But um, that is true. I mean, you will notice the difference a kernel can make from one update to another on Arch for sure. So, is there one you wanted to grab? Uh, let's see. There are a couple of good ones here. Um, uh, oh, I'm actually kind of curious about this one. Uh, someone asked if you have any any videos about Ubuntu Pro uh, out or in the works. I don't yet, and this is um, just kind of like in, inside knowledge a little bit. Um, I, I've hit a really busy part in the video production, and it, it's getting to a point where it's totally manageable and it's so refreshing. But um, that unfortunately, the queue I call it my editing queue is causing me um a little bit of a backlog to get to something like that. I have looked into it. I haven't deep dived into it yet. Um for what I've seen it it seems like uh, a nice value add for the people that want to opt into it. I don't really think it's going to make that much of a difference or if any difference for those of you out there that really don't need it. But um I hope to do a video on it at some point, but I probably have over 50 videos in the queue right now. So <laughs> Um, but it is something that should be covered. So I, so I totally agree on that. And I think that's the hardest part about content creation. It's like, what do you cover? What do you don't? They, everything deserves to be covered, right? But it, uh, there's also 24 hours in a day and you have to be asleep for part of that. So, but I, I hope to. Hmm. Yeah, Ubuntu Pros uh, is a Canonical's uh, kind of uh, extra package for support for Ubuntu. So for example, an LTS will get uh, guaranteed five years of support uh, but not um, 
of for the main repository. So not universe, not you know, not the the community supported stuff. Um, what Ubuntu support does is it gives you uh, cool things like, for example, a kernel uh, live patch updates. So if you if you're running a server and there's a, a vulnerability, uh, not everything can be patched live, but if there's a vulnerability that can be, uh, Ubuntu will automatically download that and and patch your kernel while it's running. So it's still safer to run to install the upgrade and then reboot. Yeah, we're going to have that, some protection there. Um, that's a great value right there to have for sure. Um, and that was the, the main thing I think for a long time. Uh, now uh, we have a extended security maintenance uh, for Ubuntu. So for the LTS is now instead of five years, uh, there's an extended window of ten years that you get with Ubuntu Pro. So uh, and very new is uh, they're starting to update uh, the universe repository and offer updates. I think they partnered with someone uh, to get updates. So uh, where those you wouldn't get those at all anymore. So um, uh, and the best of all, it's free for uh, five machines for everyone. Need more than that, then you, it's it's like twenty five dollars a year for desktop. Or I think one hundred twenty five for servers. Uh, that's not my department, uh, but it's, it's very reasonable. But five free, and the best part of all is they're not personal licenses. They're just licenses. So if you run a very small business and you just need one for your server, you, it is it is okay to use it commercially. Um, and then you know when you grow, think of canonical, I guess. But uh, it is actually a really really cool thing. So um, uh, yeah, if anyone was kind of what's going on here, well, try it out. It's free. There was an interesting side effect it caused me that was good actually that I thought was helpful uh, indirectly, of course. So I, I was just, um, I can't remember if I was running apt update or whatever it was, but it came up and said, you know, these packages are under extended security maintenance. I'm like what? And I looked at the packages, they were Python two packages. I'm like, I didn't even know I had those on my system. So thank you for that reminder. And I went right into my Ansible setup. And I'm like, purge those things because um, extended maintenance in this case means it's not supported, but they'll support it for you if you opt in. In, in my case, I don't want anything legacy. So I took it as a, as a, a notification that I had something like that. So I'm like, I'll just purge that right now. So that was pretty helpful, I think. Yeah, there's uh, oh, there is some static on online about that because uh, to some people it looks like a it, it, and the community council is actually uh, discussing we, we got to fix our messaging here because it looks like it's an advertisement. Oh, hey, so uh, we got these updates, but uh, if you want to pay for them, and that's not what's going on. Uh, there, there are extra updates that that aren't part of the promise of Ubuntu, um, but that are now available as a new feature. So that's kind of a cool sort of thing. Um, I think the way to look at that, um, and I know a lot of people are not going to like this opinion, but I'm always going to be honest. Um, you know, Ubuntu is owned by Canonical, a company. There's company distributions. There's community distributions, okay? The way I look at it, if this kind of thing bothers you, you should not be using a, a distribution made by a company. And I understand the reason why people hate me saying that is because they don't want to change distributions because they might love it. They might really enjoy it. but at some point, it's in my mind, it doesn't really make a difference because as a company, um, they're they're supporting this project and they're not asking me for money. If they want to just let me know what they're up to in a terminal message, and you can totally remove this. It's not hard. Um, I, I don't personally see a problem with that, although some people feel completely differently and they think that's a bad thing. But the way I look at it... Um, these types of things should be expected from a, a distribution backed by a company because companies exist to make money. Even if the project is open source, it doesn't change the fact that there's bills to pay. And it's a it's a hard line to follow. When do you let your customers know about something or when are you talking too much and um, annoying them? And that's a really hard balance to, to hit, I think. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of, um, I mean, I, I know... I have the back chatter. I, I think it's a perfectly good policy. I, it's a really great service. Um, free is great. I'm a Ubuntu member, so I get I get 50 licenses for free, which is one wow. heck of a perk. That's um, pretty cool. If you if you contribute to the Ubuntu community and you're working on things and making things better, uh, and you apply for membership, that's one of the neat little perks you get. Um, I've seen a lot of back channel chatter, so I I think that there's nothing wrong with the service or what it offers, um, but I think there's confusion. People aren't quite sure somehow it's not being communicated effectively and that's those, those are two different things right so we're right. working on that but but in the back channel i, I know mark shuttleworth um i've met him a few times he just says he he's funding everything out of his pocket i mean 
the company's profitable now, but he did right. this for years, and, and he he created Ubuntu, he created Canonical. There's no, they're they're governed differently, but his you know uh, what he wanted kind of was the starting point, and so I know for a fact that he 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 wanted to give the free lines. You know, obviously he if it's just free, no one, no one will donate money. Companies won't donate. And this is one thing that, you know, companies are paying Canonical to do is to keep, to continue supporting this. And they wanted to expand it. So he thought, wouldn't it be great to um, support the community by giving out free licenses? So people who are just using it at home, you know, can get all these benefits, right? Um, and, and, and give back that way. So, um, you know, he, now I don't want to speak for him, but he probably thought, oh, I'm doing such a nice thing. And, uh, you know, this would be a, a good, way to get back I, that that makes a lot of sense to me and i think yeah communication is important i agree also um give it a shot i mean personally i hate rebooting i hate it i mean it just drives me nuts i have to i mean i'm very very particular i know cry me a river right you have to reboot boohoo what's the problem i, I know i know how that sounds but I, i'm just being honest i hate rebooting so if canonical is releasing a live patching service that you know live patching um and i'm going to reboot fewer times i i'm okay with that i i mean obviously there's other reasons for a reboot but at the same time that's more uptime for me i don't see the problem there um yeah, yeah. absolutely patch my kernel yeah well that's also one of the reasons that the, the the notice ended up uh showing up on the command line and not in the gui or like i think it will eventually um you know that they wanted to make sure that the people who are administrators who run servers will, would get that information and then do with it as they will. Um, and so, um, you know, I think there was just, I think it's a little bit of a mountain out of, out of a molehill. It's not, they're not, you know, right. charging for Ubuntu. It's not an advertisement. It's not adware or anything. It's just like, hey, there's this new thing that came up. And if you want it, you can have it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. you know, but I, I think, um, I think uh, hopefully there'll be, you know, more blog posts and people get get excited about it. Um, but it's completely optional and kind of fun. And yeah, as Java Beans mentioned, um, uh, the uh, Ubuntu real time kernel uh, just hit general availability. So if you're running Ubuntu core on the Raspberry Pi, you already had this because IoT is where that's important. But um, yeah, if you, um, it's not compatible with the NVIDIA drivers, and I don't know about AMD at the moment, um, which should improve. But yeah, if you, if you need real time uh, kernels for something, something does not mean desktop use or games that's not what i would design for music or industrial use whatever uh you can grab it it's been tested and uh, it should continue to uh to grow but it's opt-in and it's free so that's kind of a i think that was yesterday yeah i think it was yesterday the day before i remember that hitting my email feed uh this week yep. so i have a question for you what do you think about pop os have you had a chance to check that out I know you're well versed in Ubuntu, but yeah. I'm just curious there. You know, I haven't. I, I, I'm. I really sorry. Pop OS had to exist. I think the way that uh, Ubuntu transitioned away from Unity and into GNOME, I think there were a lot of questions for a little bit about what that was going to look like. Um, I don't think GNOME shell at the time was a very friendly first user experience out of the box. And um, mm -hmm. System76 uh, said, well, if we need we need certain certainties here. And they decided to go and do something really cool. And since they were doing that to design a, a desktop shell that was just, you know, a really cool uh, type of interface. And um, uh, so I'm sorry that they felt they had to do that. But what they came up with was really cool. And I'm happy about that. So uh, I really do like Pop! OS, but I'm not very familiar with it. I, yeah, I feel the same way. Um, I've actually had a chance to talk to them about this, and and I want to be be clear. I'm not quoting anyone here because I cannot remember exact you know words that they used, but I've I, I've met them several times. And if you think about it, you have a PC company. You know, let's take Dell for example. Windows 11 comes out, and they start shipping it, and they're going to get a bunch of calls. Why is the start menu closer to the middle of the screen? And then they get these calls because all of a sudden Microsoft changed the OS. Microsoft could change their OS anytime they want. And that's totally fair. Now, um, when Ubuntu comes out with a new release, a new uh, GNOME release might change some things. And yeah, maybe they might put an extension in there to kind of um, make that better for their users. But when it comes to System76, they're selling computers. They have to pay people to answer the phones. 
So if they're at the mercy of someone else's design decisions, I mean, it's one thing if the design decisions is something that they agree with. And I think they've been pretty fair. I don't think they, they're rage quitting or anything like, like some people think, but um, they need to be in control of their own ship. And I, I think that's basically what they were trying to tell me when I had a conversation with them, that they kind of want some control over that. So it wasn't like, shame on ubuntu we hate ubuntu we're going to do something out no it was nothing like that in fact they still ship ubuntu as an option if you want to go that direction you don't have to use pop os but um so what they could have done and i think this is the the amazing part of this is they could have said well this is for our computers so if you buy our computers you can get pop os for everyone else there's ubuntu they could have done that but it works on any computer they don't care so I think the way that they handled it, it, it was very was was great. Um, but we're in a state of transition again as they're creating their own desktop environment because there's issues with GNOME and tiling. It works really well, but there's a few little quirks, let's just say. And it, I don't think it's anything to do with them. It's just I think they're asking too much out of um, the GNOME shell. It just wasn't designed to do some of the things that they wanted to do with it. I think they outgrew it, honestly. So. Yeah, it was definitely my impression at the time uh, from uh it's uh carl rochelle isn't it who runs mm -hmm. some 76 i yeah. think Rick so, how you say it, but i could be wrong on that yeah carl um so he uh ubuntu just didn't know what they were doing um for about two months and mm -hmm. uh, maybe three and then everything worked out and it worked out in time for the release and so end users who don't care about that and just hit the upgrade well the ones who don't care probably aren't running the interim releases but uh, nobody you know it was it was pretty good i i marched up to mark shuttleworth when i saw him at a canonical internal they do events every six months everyone flies and it's great they can all sprint and twice i've been well once i guess i've been there the Buddha mm -hmm. summit that was just the after party i didn't have anywhere to do but i got invited and i saw mark shuttleworth and i marched up to him and i told him i was really disappointed about unity and um i had seen I, some of the chatter on reddit and um which is still fun to remember but um i I said, uh, you know, I thought the best thing that Canonical could have ever done was to uh, have the Ubuntu session for GNOME with their customizations. And then if you, because people hate that because Ubuntu is ruining everything again, they want vanilla GNOME. This was a chance, why didn't, so there was, you could just say app install GNOME dash session and get the vanilla GNOME. And um, I said, that yeah, we need to repeat thing. that app install GNOME session and, and underscore yes. that because I feel like not a lot of people know you can do that. Right. And and I, I told Mark, I, I said, I told him right there, I said, you know, I think the smartest thing the canonical could have done was to put them side by side because everyone, you know, then I said, I, I felt at the time a canonical, canonical and Ubuntu had made, made GNOME minimally usable. And I, I think today, actually, I've been running GNOME for my book and I, I haven't switched back yet um, to Unity, which I will probably after scale. But um, uh, it, it's today. It's really nice. Today it's really nice. In, in 2018, I, I was not as happy with it. So, hmm. um, I um, so Aaron Prisk asked uh, a question, and uh, since he's the uh, canonical Ubuntu community engineer that's helping with scale, I'd like to get that. Uh, are there any emerging emerging Linux technologies that get you really excited? Yeah, I'm really excited for the uh, the professional offerings by Canonical. And uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, it's uh, actually I am. They're actually really cool. And like I said, the best thing of all, I wish I wish uh, uh, landscape were a little easier, a little freer. I, I wish I always felt everyone should get get like three licenses for that. That landscape is the uh, managed. Uh, dashboard where you can you can uh, sign up your computers and you can see what they're running and if there are updates and manage it all from there. Uh, but I think Ubuntu Pro actually is really kind of cool. I think what makes me really happy uh, that it's not really emerging, I wouldn't say, are, are snaps. I, I like the fact that I can get my uh, LTS. Uh, you know, I don't at the moment I'm not running a, a separate writing computer. Although um, if I get a little more room cleared out, I, I probably will. So I just just that's where I do all my fiction writing. And what I want for that is I want an LTS. That is incredibly boring. That has the games taken off. No solitaire. No no minesweeper. Can't have that. Hmm. Uh, has the web browser uh, taken off, so I can't you know play around on the web, read Reddit while I'm supposed to be writing. Uh, it has LibreOffice, and it has um, maybe Focus Writer, which is I kind of really like. And it has an XCloud client, so I just hit save and I don't have to you know sneaker net anything. Um, and is otherwise very boring. And so, but I also want to have the same version of LibreOffice on every computer. 
uh, because, well, if anyone's done the Microsoft Office dance, you know, around around the time a new version comes out, it's it's like you know, it's it's fun. Um, and Snaps let me do that. So Slap Snaps let me have a really boring operating system, but when and where I choose, like the latest version of a program directly from the developers in many cases. And it's just automatically updated and I never have to worry about it. So on my main computer, I'm running the dev version and this and that, and it'll boot and all kinds of fun stuff because it's fun for me. But on my work computer that I rely on, I can be, have a super dependable, super dependable um, you know, uh, operating system thanks to the release cadence and one or two programs are the best uh, and newest things. So that's searching and I'm looking forward to you know what snaps do next they're, they're always improving it so uh it should be fun so I'm going to say that that's also my answer but I know I should give another answer because you know just agreeing is is, is kind of boring right but I'll, I'll expand on yours real quick and just say I like universal packages in general okay um I like them all I like the concept I think it's required and, and there's some people out there that'll say oh we don't need that apt install is fine I've never needed anything else and I'm thinking well that's great for you, not needing anything else, but because just because you don't need anything else does not mean that there's not a use case for it. And no technology is going to be for everyone, right? Um, there's some things that are amazing, just might not fit my use case. But just like you're saying, um, people like like developers being able to release directly to their uh, customers is, is awesome. That That's the way it should be. Um, because I think what people need to understand is that People outside of our community don't understand us in this way. Like a Mac OS user, a Windows user, a new, they get a notification or maybe in their newsfeed that a new version of their favorite application comes out. They don't even have to think about it. They just go to their the vendor's website, download an executable installer or a DMG installer, whatever it is, and they install the latest software, they're fine. But generally speaking, unless we're on a rolling distribution, and so long as there's not like an extra repository, Linux users are generally expected to not have the latest software until the entire release of their entire operating system. And as much as I love Linux, this makes no sense. Like I totally understand server workstation people, obviously you don't really want the latest bleeding edge everything. I'm not saying you should have the latest everything, but what I am saying is if you want the latest, piece of software, you should have access to that. And you shouldn't have to go on the command line and add a PPA. Nothing wrong with that if that's how you like to solve the problem. But just keep in mind, there's people out there not as technical that really don't want to do that. They just want, want their software. That's all they want. So I feel like it's a great solution. But the my answer to the question about emerging technologies, I I, th I feel like um, this is I'm going to get like flamed for this, but I'm just going to throw it out there because I know a lot of people hate this idea, and I like it. Um, I like the idea of a, an immutable base, an immutable distribution that's read only. Now um, we're running up on time here because we have another live stream starting, but um, there's a lot of false understandings here because people assume that an immutable distribution, you cannot make customizations. You can't apt install something. You can't change your wallpaper. You can't go into Etsy and manage config files. It's possible that a distribution that, that's immutable might be like that, but there's there's technologies that exist. Um, and without going in, into too much detail, where, where you have every bit the same amount of control, but people hear the word immutable and they're like, no, I don't want that. Um, it's just the way that changes are managed is different, but from a security standpoint, there's nothing better than something read only. I mean, that's the, I mean, what's better than that? You don't have to worry about someone accidentally deleting everything or RM dash RF the entire file system. It's read only. There's, you can't even do that. So I feel like that's a good way forward. There's some pros and cons, but, um, when I say immutable base, that means obviously the distribution part is immutable. You can still make changes immutable distributions in their entirety are basically the same as a live CD from back in the day. You can't really do a whole lot, but I'm really excited to see how that plays out because um, I encourage everyone who's against the technology or they think that it sounds ridiculous, just really look into this because I don't think it's going to be as um, constricting as you, you think it might be, in my opinion. Yeah, I think once uh, once the desktop, I know, uh, I think, uh... Fedora has a project. I think OpenSUSE has a project. I think they're. I think um, OpenSUSE is moving to it. I don't even think it's a project. I think they're they're just trying to figure out at what version they're going to just roll it roll out to that. So yeah. Right. 
And so I, I think once those really become mainstream and, and you know have had a couple of development cycles, I think I, I don't think most users will notice a big difference. Um, they won't notice but they'll anything. just have a, a more more secure system. Uh, it's like the whole when uh, when uh, everyone went to uh, Upstart and then everyone went to System D like a year later. Um, it you know a lot of people were really angry about it, and a lot of people who you know, work on uh, in its systems were had very strong opinions and most of the people who didn't in work on those didn't had very strong opinions but but to what end it was more like a custom right end users didn't notice any difference at all whatsoever right. even though the way the offering system launched and managed every process ever run that ever runs completely changed but to the end user it was no big deal so anyone worried about that um you can look in and hop in and test these things early but mm -hmm. um, you know, by the time it's it's out, if, if you're just worried about it and don't want to test it, um, by the time it's by the time you get it, it will just work. So there's no need to worry about it ahead of time. Oh, no need to worry about it at all. So all right, so we're coming up on time. There's a channel member and patron specific live stream that's starting here in a few minutes. So if you are a patron or channel member, thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, if you are, you're welcome to attend that with us. You could check uh, the YouTube community page. I put a link up on there. Um, or you can uh, check the Patreon page, depending on where you are there. So I, I hope to see some uh, folks over on, on that live stream. So I apologize for anyone we didn't get to answer. But maybe we'll be able to do this again. I think that'd be pretty cool. Maybe sometime that'd be uh, fun. on the road. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, some um, really good questions here. I have one, one last comment uh, for yeah. anyone who... Uh, is trying Ubuntu for the first time, especially if you get my book, Beginning Ubuntu uh, for Windows and Mac users or, or any other uh, beginning book, or you just grab the disk and have an adventure because you can, uh, well, it's they're not disks anymore, they're USB keys, aren't they? But you boot off of it, you try it, you can try it without installing it on your computer. And um, the best thing to do when you have a new operating system, I would say, uh, you online said there's 10 things everyone should do when they first install Ubuntu or people start install GNOME tweaks and then, right? I would say, take a one week or two if you can and just play with it and see what it's like and see how you like it and what you don't and then go then go wild and make changes but um otherwise you know if, if you um follow an article you'll never know if you, what you changed if there if it causes problems it might be because of that you know so just just get if you've yep. never used Linux before just get your bearings a little bit because you can go wild and change everything so see what it offers first uh, and, yeah. and then have fun that's that's my advice yeah, just like I tell my kids, you know, before you put like Parmesan cheese all over the pasta, at least right. find out what it tastes like beforehand. Exactly. I put a lot of work into that food. Thank you very much. Um, but but just like in the distributions, try live mode and and you could just test out some things, install it and, you know, have some fun and, and you know, break it and then, you know, find out how to fix it. You know, that's always fun yeah. too. So, yeah. And, you know, Bintu is the best distro out there, but uh, they're all kind of great. Even the really niche ones are really, really great for what they're designed for. So, uh, you know, uh, at scale, people were always surprised to see the Debian and Fedora and Susan people all and Ubuntu people all chatting and having fun because there's no rivalry for the pros, um, friendly rivalry maybe, but you know, we're all working together. We're all making Linux better. So um, use what you yep. use and have fun and, and uh, you know, you can celebrate when other people enjoy other distros as well. So, so where can people find your book? People can find my book uh, at, at Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, the usual places. You can go to apress.com. Uh, what really helps me out is if you go to nhames.com and mm -hmm. click the link, I get a, it's an affiliate link from Amazon, and I, that basically doubles my royalty for that purchase without costing you any extra money. Um, yeah. And if you have any questions and you read the book, you can email me. So, um, oh, uh, if you want the ebook, uh, you want the print book and the ebook, um, don't buy the print book from Amazon and or a press, but don't buy the ebook from Amazon. It's really expensive. Uh, I think you get a companion. I think it's like five bucks or something if you uh, buy it from a press if you bought the print version. So, yeah, um, I think I do remember that being the case, possibly. Um, in in my case, UbuntuServerBook.com. There you go. Just, just go there and you can grab a copy. I just keep it simple. Um, but but in, in your case, it's not all that much different. Just go to that website and grab a copy and that'd be appreciated. Absolutely. So, all right. So uh, hopefully we'll see as many of you as possible in the next live stream. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me on here. It was great. Yep.
No problem. My pleasure.